so first of all, I, I suppose I'd just really like to thank Oxford Nanopore for inviting me here today because Oxford Nanopore put on the best conferences, so, so it's really nice to be here. And it's really nice to be in New York in December as well. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about how Minine is changing my research. And, and really, I was kind of PCR focused for many years and, on the diagnosis of infection. And, and, and Minine has really changed the way I, I, I think about diagnosis. So um, just to declare no conflicts of interest, uh, I don't get paid by Oxford Nanopore. I receive free flow cells like pretty much everyone else in the room. And uh, I, uh, I'm a member of MAP. I did, I did get this nice pen today. So that's pretty good. So in terms of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to talk about the need for rapid infections. To, uh, diseases diagnostics, why we need it. I, I, I'm going to talk about minion sequencing, a little bit about the technology. I'm going to talk about UTIs or urinary tract infections, and I'm going to talk about how I'm using minion to diagnose UTIs. So the reason we need uh, rapid infections to diseases diagnostics is because the current system that we use, which is culture, takes way too long. So culture takes two days. One, to grow the organism on a plate or in whatever, and then another day to find out what it's susceptible to in terms of treatment. So uh, the problem with that is that if you're sick and you go to hospital and you uh, get your samples taken and it takes two days to get a result, the doctor can't wait two days to treat you. So they have to treat you immediately, and they have to treat you with something, so they treat you with antibiotics and they treat you with broad spectrum antibiotics. So these antibiotics will kill uh, all bacteria, or as, you know, as many bacteria as possible. And that's not ideal for a number of reasons. So some patients get antibiotics when they shouldn't get antibi antibiotics at all. Maybe they have a viral infection. Maybe they don't have an infection at all. Maybe it's something else. And some patients are over-treated. So that effect, oops. Um, that effectively means uh, that you've given them a, 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 a very potent antibiotic when they really don't need it. They could do with something less potent. Some patients are under-treated, which effectively means that the drug that you've chosen will not work for them because the strain that they have infecting them is resistant to the antibiotic that you chose. So all this leads to very poor patient outcomes and poor antimicrobial stewardship and eventually the development of antibiotic resistance, which is a big topic at the moment. So that's really the, re the, the need, for, that's the reason for, for, for the need for urgent and rapid diagnostics. So, um, so as I said, I spent a long time uh, working on PCR-based tests. And the reason PCR doesn't work very well for this is not because it's not rapid enough. It, it certainly is rapid enough. The problem is it's not comprehensive enough. It doesn't tell you. Uh, everything that's in a sample. It only tells you what you, if, 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 if what you tell it to look for is there. So for instance, you design a PCR test for Staph aureus, and it'll tell you if Staph aureus is there or not. It will not tell you if anything else is there or not. So that's why sequencing-based diagnostics is a good idea. right? So we can take uh, next generation sequencing, and we can look for, we, we, can, we can sequence a, a, a clinical sample and we can detect bacterial pathogens, viruses, fungi, viable but non-culturable organisms that culture cannot handle, and even dead pathogens, which is useful sometimes. We can also, uh, it, it, it's very rapid compared to culture, which is good, and especially now with, um, with the types of technology such as Minine, which has sped things up greatly. Um, we can detect um, antibiotic resistance markers using this technology. And it will allow us to uh, develop um, stratified antibiotic treatment. So we can now sequence a clinical sample, and we can tell you what's in it in terms of a pathogen. And we can tell the doctor what to treat with immediately or with, within a few hours. So it will allow us to use narrow spectrum agents. So not just use broad spectrum antibiotics, which kill lots of things, but use narrow spectrum agents, which kill a specific organism or a group of organisms. Also, it will enable, enable us to, um, to uh, test uh, narrow spectrum agents and use them in the future. So we have to be able to trial them 
If you cannot uh, do a diagnostic trial without the right diagnostics, you cannot do a, a, a drug trial without the right diagnostics. So if you have good diagnostics, you can good, do good trials, and you can uh, uh, start to use narrow spectrum antibiotics, which would be very helpful in the future. So with sequencing, you can go, you can detect bacterial or viral, you can detect the bacterial type, you can detect whether there's resistance presence. What you cannot do is, is detect susceptibility, and that's a little bit more challenging, and you need the, the, the um, isolate, really, to be able to do that. We're working on methods of doing that and speeding that up, but it's a little bit more time-consuming. So this is just a picture of our sequencing lab, and a year and a half ago, I hadn't used any form of sequencing for anything, and now we're lucky enough to have, you know, we've got a MySeq and an XSeq, and we have two uh, min ions. But the point of showing this is over here across the field here in lovely rural Nor Norwich in England, we have a, a place called the, the Genome Analysis Center, which is a genome center. And in that genome center, you know, you've got every type of machine, and that's where most of the sequencing used to, used to go on. But now, you know, we've moved it into our lab here for clinical sequencing. And, and the next thing to do is to get these little sequences into real uh, clinical uh, microbiology labs and hospitals. Um, so we managed to publish, one, I think it was the first paper to use minion sequencing for, for biology. And, and so what we did was we, 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 um, we min managed to uh, identify the position and the structure of, of an antibiotic resistance island in, in, in Salmonella typhi. And you know, it, it was pretty simple stuff, really. You take the long reads of the, um, of the, from the minion, and you use it to, to, to um, uh, figure out the structure of, of, of the island, which, which had broken using alumina assembly because of repetitive regions. And this is very much out of date already because you know, people are now uh, doing um, um, de novo assemblies of, of, of full genomes. So, so this, this is out of date. It's only a year old, but it's out of date. Um, so this is the type of data that we were getting. We were, you know, we're getting 70 megabases of raw data, only, only 22 megabases of, of, of 2D data, around 5x genome coverage. Now we're getting better. This is looking, more and more of our flow cells are looking like this, giving us lots of nice green uh, pores with, with, with DNA going through them and lots of sequence. And uh, so, you know, we're getting between one and two gigs far more regularly than we used to get. And I, I really do like to show this uh, slide because because I'm up here, uh, and I think unfortunately Oxford and Adpore have decided to stop the competition, which I didn't think is a good idea. But but since they have stopped it, maybe I'll always be here. So that's that's a good thing, right? So move on to urinary tract infections. So th this is the application I'm going to talk about today. I also do a lot of work on respiratory tract infections and sepsis as well. But um, UTIs are, are one of the most common uh, infections and one of the most common reasons for prescribing antibiotics. Um, uh, they're mostly kind of mild and, and, and easy to cure, uh, but some in, uh, UTIs can become quite serious and uh, they, mo they move up the urinary tract and uh, they can turn into uh, sepsis or urosepsis. Um, so there's about 30,000 cases of uh, um, E. coli sepsis in, 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 in England in 2014, and the majority of those were, were, had a urinary origin. So they started uh, in the urinary tract. And um, about 40% of the E. coli uh, that they isolate are, are resistant to first-line treatment. So what's happening now is you're getting, this is driving the use of, of previously reserved antibiotics, oops, for, um, for, for simple infections like UTIs. And, and this isn't ideal. So obviously we've decided to try and address this by using um, Oxford nanopore sequencing to try to uh, rapidly diagnose UTIs in, in, in serious cases. So on to a point that was mentioned earlier on that, you know, uh, how do we, how do we uh, avoid using all our sequencing power for sequencing um, the, the host genome? So, so we use pathogen DNA enrichment strategies for, for most of our clinical sequencing applications. So, and they vary depending on the sample type. So with, with urine, it's, it's not that difficult in some ways because what you have is you've got a mix of human cells and bacterial cells, and, and you can do a very crude enrichment by just doing a very gentle spin, which spins down the larger human cells. 
and, um, and leaves uh, the bacterial cells in the, in the supernatant. But that gets rid of maybe 80% of the, the human um, cells, but it depends how heavily contaminated it is with human cells. And if it is heavily contaminated, you really have to do another step. So what we do then is we, um, we, we, what we do is we add a differential lysis solution. We lyse the rest of the white cells that are there. And we DNAs treat all that lysed, uh, that human DNA then. And then we're left with a bacterial pellet effectively. And we extract the DNA from that. And then we go on to do our, our, our sequencing. So um, this is a, a graph that effectively shows 10 urine samples that we've done over, about it, in, over around a year. And then we've done some spiked urine samples along the way as well. And we spiked them with this nasty NDM uh, strain of E. coli, a highly drug-resistant strain of E. coli. And what you can see is that over time, uh, things have gotten a lot better. You know, we're on a steady increase in the total yield of, 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 of data that we get from each flow cell. We weren't very good here at the start. Some of the reagents weren't excellent. Some of the flow cells weren't excellent. But pretty much, we've been getting better and better all the time. So, and this also illustrates that, and it just shows the three spiked samples, this nasty E. coli bug using the three chemistries, MAP4, MAP5, and MAP6. And you can see after one hour with these three different chemistries, the, the difference in, in, in um, yield after one hour of sequencing between the three chemistries. And, and that's good for us. That, that, you know, the shorter sequencing time we have to get decent coverage, the better. So um, this is just what we use. We're, we're not good bioinformaticians in my lab, I'm afraid. So we like to use these automated t tools that are provided by, um, or by, by, by Oxford Nanopore. So WIMP is brilliant for us. It, it does exactly what we need it to do. And, and so we just uh, feed these reads in real time directly into WIMP. And we see that we uh, identify, in this case, this nasty E. coli. You know, it, it won't tell us exactly what E. coli it is, but we know it's E. coli within about five minutes. We know it's E. coli. So then um, we've also been using uh, AMRA, which is uh, Oxford Nanopore's uh, antimicrobial resistance detection database, um, which we have been working with just for a month or so now. And you can see that um, it's able to detect um, uh, various resistance genes. In, in this case, you know, this NDM E. coli has this NDM1 uh, variant in it. And, and that's, we, it can detect that. And we can say this is an NDM uh, E. coli. And you know, it's a beta uh, lactamase isolated from Klebsiella pneumonia. And so we, we, we know that. And that's great. That's, it. that's exactly what it is. So, so we've, we've done a comparison between uh, Illumina sequencing and Minion sequencing for detection of antimicrobial resistance. And we've done it using the, this is just an example where we've done uh, th this nasty E. coli again. And, and this is the MAP04 run. This is the MAP05 run. And this is the MAP06 run using ARMA. So, um, so what we see is that we can, th this, the correlation here is excellent. So what we see is the Illumina uh, sequencing detects a blah tem, so do we. But what we get are multiple variants, not just the single variant that's there. And the reason that that happens is because we use single reads in uh, ARMA or, or, or using our own pipeline, which we used here. So we use single reads. We don't use a consensus. And therefore, we get multiple variants detected. But it doesn't matter that much to us. We're still finding the right family. So if you look at um, all of these, are, we're pretty much finding the right family. There's one thing here which we're not quite sure about just yet, uh, where, where, where this gene was not detected by Illumina, but we've detected it. And we think it probably is in the Illumina data, but we're not sure. OK, so that, the correlation is excellent. So, um, so what we can say is, with practically 100% specificity and sensitivity for the identification of a pathogen and all the acquired resistance genes, not the mutational resistance genes, uh, as long as we have 5x minine coverage, we have 100% sensitivity and specificity compared to Illumina sequencing results. And that's excellent. So, um, so with, with uh, MAP006, with WIMP, and with ARMA, uh, we can do the full procedure in about five hours, OK? So that's the latest. 
And we would hope to be able to bring that down by reducing the uh, time we take to do our enrichment strategies and um, uh, the time it takes to do the library prep, which we would hope that would s uh, speed up in the future. So in summary, uh, min ion measure genomic sequencing has the potential, certainly, to, to, to be the me molecular diagnostic technology of the future, in, in, in my opinion. Um, you can get real-time pathogen ID in minutes, reliable resistance uh, marker detection in about an hour, and with fast mode, you would expect that would come down significantly. Uh, but what stands in the way, really, is you need really good, um, robust, and inexpensive pathogen DNA en enrichment strategies. You need a, a, a system, particularly not for UTIs, but for sepsis, for instance, you need to be able to use very low amounts of, of, of pathogen DNA to put into the, uh, the library prep. Uh, that's important. I know you've gotten down into the nanogram range, but I, I think we need to go even lower. And then the last thing that we, the, the really biggest point in this whole area of research is there's a bit of an elephant in the room, and that, that is like um, contamination. Contamination is a massive problem. You can get contamination in any run that you do, and you can get E. coli. And it's very difficult to tell the difference between contamination E. coli and E. coli that's come from a patient. So that, we need to have you know, DNA-free plasticware. We need to have workflows in place that really avoid any form of contamination all the way through. Um, so just to acknowledge some funders and uh, my collaborators, this is Professor John Wayne and, and, and Not the Cowboy. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, any uh, questions for Justin? So, in your UTI example, how much uh, human DNA sequence um, in proportion to so called non human DNA? I think we, when we do our enrichment strategies, we're down to around 5%. 5%? Yeah. Okay. So most of the contamination is actually bacterial problem rather than a host. Most of the contamination, what, what, what do right. you mean? Right, I mean the uh, contaminations for, uh, to do this diagnostic, yes. mostly come from the environment rather than yes. the host. Uh, yes, very much so, yeah, I think so. It'll come from, you know, if, if you sequence a, a negative, you'll, you'll get some, you'll get some uh, reads, yeah, so. Hi. Um, can you describe again how you get rid of your human DNA? You, you said you do a spinning step that gets sort of 80%, and then after that, something to do with lysis. Differential lysis. So you use a, a, a low-strength uh, non-ionic buffer to, to lyse uh, white cells, but not lyse bacteria. And then you do a DNA digestion of the DNA. And then you're left with just uh, a bact all the bacteria. You spin the bacteria down, and you you extract the DNA from it. And you still only get 5% contamination. So that's 5% of your reads are human. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. It can be as high as that even after all that, yeah. I see. Even though the human genome is so much bigger, right? Than yes, the... yes. Well, we, you know, we, we, so we've, we've spun down some of them, got rid of them, and we've gone through a fairly complex procedure to get rid of the rest. So yeah, we still end up with non, I guess, what we're left with is usually what hasn't been digested by DNAs or perhaps some unlyzed human cells that go in through the uh, bacterial uh, extraction. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, well, how many uh, samples um, give you enough DNA to go through your library prep and sequencing? How many? Sam uh, what's the percentage of samples that would be infected and give you enough DNA? Uh, for library prep, I mean, does it? Do you always get enough DNA? No. So, the, so, so we did have to choose um, samples that were fairly heavily contaminated. So, so in terms of bacterial numbers per mil of urine, we would have needed around ten to the eight uh, in in a mil of urine. Now, some urines can be infected and have only ten to the five. So uh, that's an issue. But with the new uh, low input. Uh, nanogram range library prep that Oxford Nanopore have, then that's not an issue anymore. No. Hey, uh, quick question. Have you tried your differential lysis to uh, isolate intracellular bacteria and see if you can apply this technology to the identification of those agents? 
Yeah, well, so we haven't, we haven't done the experiments, but we do think that anything that is intracellular should, should be able to be uh, um, detected using this method because we lies the, the white cells. Now, if we spin down white cells and remove them, yeah, we might lose some intracellular stuff. That's fair enough. But, but I guess, yeah, to trade off. Uh, in, in UTIs, I don't think that's a massive issue, but in, in, uh, in sepsis or something, it might be, yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Justin. Thank you. Fantastic.